Hello, this is Anne de Gilles from Anne Insights. Uh, this is my second video on clinical. Uh, please make sure you go to the Anne Insights channels to see the first video where we discuss the epidemiology and the spread of the virus worldwide and in the US. Today, we are gonna be focusing on the clinical new information we have learned. And we have a lot we are learning on a weekly basis. And it has a lot of impacts. The good news, we have learned a lot and as a result of that, we have decreased the mortality rate. We'll be discussing that as well as uh, some of the issues with school reopening and new treatment. A quick reminder, uh, there is two phases to the disease. There's a viral response, which is from the time you get exposed to roughly you know, uh, it really peaks at, at five to seven days. And then some people develop the cytokine storm that you may have heard, that's roughly 20% in the US. Uh, and they develop this huge inflammatory, inflammatory response that end up forcing 20% uh, of the population to be hospitalized. And roughly a third of them will end up on a ventilator with a very high mortality rate. And two thirds would be an oxygen therapy. Uh, it was still a pretty high mortality rate of 10 to 30% and some concern about long-term recovery problem there. So we'll talk about how you address these different phases. You know, this is testing and who is contagious. That's the big thing. This is how you identify who may end up with a cytokine storm. And this is how do we treat people to keep them alive and no long-term problems. A quick reminder, and we in prior videos, we, went, we did a deeper dive, but this is not a problem of the lungs as we have learned. This, this virus attached to the uh, ACE2 uh, receptors. And as a result of that, it's pretty much everywhere in the body. And it does damage to your whole cardiovascular system there, including myocardial injuries, creating blood clots that can create strokes and pulmonary embolism. And if people get skin rashes, I mean, you can see the list. It's, it's just like a, a train wreck, unfortunately, for the body. So what do we know? Uh, we know that intervention works. In fact, it's the only thing that seems to work right now is mask and social distance, distancing. Uh, we're going to talk today about the fact that, yes, children may have lower sickness risk, but they are contagious. And, and we have some very good information that just came out this week. Uh, we also have learned that we now know how to treat people with cytokine storm much better, and that has decreased mortality rate. We know most of the patients are symptomatic, 40 to 50%, and these are the ones that spread the contagious. We know indoor transmission is significantly worse than outdoor. And if you haven't seen a prior video, please come back. Uh, and we know the virus has mutated in Germany in March. It's five times more contagious and more stable, uh, which is a concern. And we know that it's not really age that drives mortality, but pre-existing condition. And we have learned more and more of this super spreading event, which is 10% of people are basically driving 80% of transmission. If we could just control those events like the bars and, and big rallies. I'm gonna to talk today about the T cells and some of the new things we have learned. What we don't know yet is that when we get an effective vaccine, we'll talk about this, the long-term damage of COVID is coming more and more to be an issue. And how long are the antibodies? And of course that has an impact on the virus. So let's take a deeper dive. Uh, we are learning that there's some genetic mutation that can drive why some people are dying and others not. This is a case of two healthy brothers in Holland, and there are two pairs of them, so it's four people there. And some they became very ill and some recovered. What they discover is that the men have only one X chromosome versus the women have two X chromosomes. And on one of the X chromosomes is something called TLR7, which is toll like receptor 7. And it turns out to be essential for COVID protection. It's the one that stimulates the immune system to kick in when it recognizes an invader. And it turns out that if people have a mutation of that TLR7, the virus continues to, to replicate itself before the, because the immune system does not recognize it's being invaded. And they believe that if you can identify those people who have that mutation there, we may be able to give them an interferon injection to help get the immune system in gear. So, uh, so it'd be interesting uh, to see as we learn more that if we can identify more and more people may be at risk of being that cytokine storm and, and, being, and being at risk of being serious complication. A quick reminder of how the immunity works. So uh, we have what's called the neutralizing antibody. We have a lot of different type of antibodies and two weeks ago we went into details about that in the video. But the key one for the virus of, uh, of COVID is the neutralizing antibody. And we have discovered that a third of the people who have recovered don't have any antibodies. And more importantly, that it seems that after three months, this antibody dropped. And that's a concern because you, know, you, you don't want to get a second exposure there. 
There's also what's called the memory B cells. And these are the cells who are in your lymph nodes and they do remember prior infection and they're getting gear much faster than neutralizing antibodies when you're fighting an infection. And then we have the killer T cell that we're gonna talk. We've been talking about this for a couple of weeks and more and more information is coming up. And these T cells is really long-term immunity. These are a virus you've been exposed like 15, 20 years ago, and your body still has that memory that, of how to respond when you get attacked. And for example, people who had the SARS in 2003, 17 years ago, still have T cells that are responsive to the virus. So the hope is that maybe that could really help uh, in the protection if we can activate this T cell. The question is that we don't know how everybody is responding. The same amount of vaccine may have different response in different people. You may require multiple dose and we need to get 60% effectiveness to reach herd immunity. But what happens if people refuse to have the vaccine? So lots of issue about uh, there is no silver bullet vaccine that will take care of this is kind of the conclusion and we'll talk more about it. Let's kind of refresh our memory on the viral load. So you get exposed after one or two days there, you have that huge spike and this is a 10 million viral RNA copies uh, that are detected by the PCR. And then it drops down. And after two, two to four weeks, uh, we don't really measure too much of it. And any of these little spikes there, the question people are asking is, when are you contagious? Because the PCR detects the fact you have the virus. It doesn't detect if you are contagious. And we have seen people as, as, as long as 80 days who are still shedding the virus. And, and so let's take a look to a deeper dive. This week, there was an interesting analysis, and I put the videos here, looking what's called the CT value. And the CT value is to see when you're contagious, and I'm simplifying something. And the idea here is that it's in the reverse order. So if you're in that zone, so you have a low CT value, this is the area between two to seven to 10 days where you're contagious. And everybody's been arguing about, well, we need a very highly sensitive PCR test. So we have this, these amazing tests that take you know, seven days uh, to do the testing to detect a very low level here of the virus. But we don't really care about that. What we want to do is to detect the people at this level when they are contagious. And that's when people are now trying to develop right now easier tests that can detect this zone here. They may not be as accurate as this, but what we want is fast, quick turnaround tests for people who are identified when they're contagious so that we quarantine them during that period here. And so, uh, so, so that's something I think we need to change how we define testing and what we're looking for. We're not really looking at the PCR to see if you have a virus in your body. We're looking to say, are you infectious and contagious? So let's expand that concept. A study came out uh, where they review 41 study published from the UK and Italy. And what they discover is that what's the amount of day when you're shedding the virus? And you can see that could be up to you know, the 60 days here. And is, is there a correlation with aging? And this is really interesting. What they found, some people were as high as 80 days. They say, oh my gosh, are you infectious for 80 days? Absolutely not. They discovered that people are infectious for one week after onset. The viral load, the peak is at three to five days, like I just showed in the prior slides. This is where it gets more interesting. There seems to be a correlation between how long you're shedding and if you're gonna be at risk of a severe outcome. And the older patients basically are shedding more for longer than the younger patient, which may explain also why they have worse outcome. And the asymptomatic people are basically not shedding for very long and have a lower amount of viral load than the symptomatic. So this all makes sense. So the question is that why are we using PCR, which is really a, a, an amazing Cadillac uh, level there, because it's not really what we're looking for. What we want to see is that, are you infectious? And are you at risk of a severe complication? And, and so it's not really looking at the viral RNA we're looking for is that, how seriously are you at risk of something going the wrong direction there? So more infection, uh, more information on identify if you're contagious as opposed to if you're carrying the virus. This is even more interesting that just came out which is we did a PCR test on 145 people were mild to moderate patient. And remember, we did that, that, that cycle tri threshold, which is looking at how contagious you are. And what they discovered is that the kid between the age of five to 17 years old were as contagious as the adults. But here's this point, interesting. Remember my CT score, the lower you are, the more contagious you are, which means the less than five years old were more contagious. They had more of a viral load 
and therefore they are at risk of spreading it to the population, which of course, you know, begs some questions about reopening the school. And the real example of that is what just hit the news today in Georgia was there was a YMCA and 260 people tested positive out of 344 tested, so pretty bad. Overall, it was 44% of the children and the staff. The camp was only open for four days before they shut it down. But here again, another confirmation. Most of the positive tests were six to 10 years old. They are contagious. They do spread the virus. They may not have the severity of the outcome, but they are contagious. So the earlier thinking that children may not be as susceptible to COVID is wrong. And this is a quote from that CDC report. And what they saw is that 75% of the young person who got it also developed some symptoms, not severe symptoms, but they got some symptoms. The children are carriers, they are contagious, and they may be even more contagious than an adult. And that has consequences on how we reopen the schools. Let's look at T cells. Uh, a study from Germany came out and looking at that CD4 T cells, the killer cells, and they look at unexposed healthy donors. donors. What they discover is that People who had had exposure to COVID had 83% of CD4 T cells, which makes sense because you expect them to be activated. But this was a surprise. 35% of unexposed patients, people who had not been exposed to COVID, had their T cells that were reactive when they, when they tested them. And that's very interesting because what it means is that we have been exposed to prior coronavirus that has created T cell response in our body. And there is a belief that if you think about the traditional common cold, it is a variety of the coronavirus. And, and, and we may have developed some of the T cells into our body, but that may explain why some people, especially the younger people, have a stronger T cell response than the older population there. This paper just came out on Nature. Here's the link. And now we come up with this concept of cross-reactive T cells immunity, which means part of the population may have a strong T cell immunity from having been exposed in the past to a different uh, a type of coronavirus, but still close enough to the COVID-19 that they have uh, already some T cells that could modulate the severity of the infection. So to, to just to be clear, they will still get infected and they will still get symptoms. They won't get as sick, they won't be uh, as severe. And so, so that's, let me explain some of the diversity. And let me explain what we saw last week that in Vietnam, uh, they had a lower uh, case rate. Uh, and that may be because they probably have been infected by more bat related coronavirus diseases than we have here. As a result of the testing shortage that we have, the CDC has authorized pool, pool, but the FDA has authorized pool testing. When, to give you an idea, tested 6 million people in two weeks when they had a little outbreak a few weeks ago. They did that by pulling five people's samples into one so they can have a very quick turnaround. And if that pool turns positive, then they can test the five individuals. And that allows them to have this massive amount of testing that we haven't been able to do in the US. So the US is going to start looking into that. And you can see the accuracy, it go from 95 to 99 to 90 to 99 percent, but I showed you before. You don't really need a sensitivity of detecting a low level of the viral load. You just want to detect people who are contagious. So that may be very effective. So hopefully we'll activate that. I really want now to focus on something that's really concerning. Uh, we all have been arguing about, well, that's the death rate, what's the fatality rate, what's the infection fatality rate, and confirm excess deaths. I mean, you know, you could get stuck into the math on that one. The bigger issue is that if I tell you, okay, you have a one to 3% chance of dying, that's very different than if I tell you you have a 30 to 50% chance of having long-term damage for the rest of your life that will affect how you live and what you can do. That's suddenly become a much bigger story. So let's take a look at this. So the worry is that, you know, uh, what's happening to the body? A study came out from the CDC uh, last week uh, that 35% of non-hospitalized people, so people had mild to medium cases that were treated at home. So I just emphasize, these are not the people in the hospitals. 35% have long-term illness. And that's what I'm trying to tell you. That is the real iceberg. This is the real problem with this disease. They are not back to normal after three weeks. And what they discover is that a lot of these people had mild outpatient illness, but they have long-term problems. And when they get diagnosed, they discover that they have problems that are pretty serious. 26% for people between the age of 18 to 34. These are the young people uh, who don't think they're at risk. 47% for people over the age of 50, that's a massive number. 
Symptoms are cough, fatigue, and shortness of breath. So let's take a look what could go wrong. Uh, the thing we remember is that there's this blood clot that gets created uh, by the virus who's kind of screwing up the endothelium inside the arteries. And so uh, in Wuhan, they did a study when they discovered that 20% of people had heart damage after the cytokine storm, and they had no heart history of any problem before. So these were healthy people there. And they end up you know, having what's called long-term heart failure. Another study from Germany, they did the autopsy of people there, and they find out these people are massive damage to their heart. And these were healthy people there. So uh, we talked last week about uh, the 60 countries from Europe who pull all their data there. So it's a very large data sets and 55% had abnormal echocardiograph scan, i.e. It's, it's, it's real damage uh, in the heart. Uh, we also have discovered when we do autopsy that there's blood clots everywhere and the vessels are leaking. And of course that creates problems with pulmonary embolism and strokes. And, and they say it's really massive. They have never seen so much blood clots. So uh, the study came out looking at magnetic resonance imaging, which is much high, more expensive and more uh, precise than just do echocardiography, which is more ultrasound based. So these are expensive machines and they look at post-COVID heart abnormalities. And this is stunning. 78% of the people had a problem. Now, some of them will recover, but some may not. And we're still learning that because the time hasn't happened yet. So they had 70% uh, had cardiac abnormalities with 60% having myocardial inflammation, i.e. they had damage to the heart that the body was fighting. 67% uh, recovered at home, 33% hospitalized. So two thirds of those people there were treated at home. They were the maltreatment cases. And uh, this is a study that was uh, published uh, in JAMA. So it's a very credible journal there uh, based on a study done in Germany. Uh, we also have learned that there's delirium, and that probably is mini, you know, mini strokes or TIAs, trans ischemic attacks, when you get a little blood clot for a short period of time. Wuhan uh, has now done a study showing that 36% of people have neurological symptoms from stroke, headaches, memory fraud. And same thing is coming out of Germany and other uh, interesting study from Europe. And it's clear if you've been on a ventilator, which is something we've known from people on ventilator, we highly sedate you and we paralyze you. And when people come up, a lot of them have hallucination, which is part of the, having been on the ventilator for so long, as well as PTSD risk long-term. Uh, and then just to put on top of it, uh, people are discovering that they kind of go up and down the stairs, they, sh they have shortness of breath. And when we do the X-ray of their lungs, there's massive fibrosis and damage, especially for people who have been smoker. And then therefore that, that drives chronic fatigue. So I want to emphasize, I think we're going to learn in the next several months, that is the real problem of COVID. It's not the mortality rate and the argument is at 0 0.5 or 2% or 3%. Honestly, if these numbers continue to be so high, that is going to be totally overwhelming the healthcare system because we're talking about millions of people in the US who may be at risk of needing long-term care. As a result of that, guess what? Uh, we talked last week, I'll go briefly above this, about building rehab centers. And, and it's happening in, 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 in Italy, it's happening in New York, and we're starting to learn, we're just starting to learn what's happening to what they call the COVID long haulers. So more to be said uh, over the coming weeks, but look at the numbers. Uh, in Italy, they report 50% of psychological problems, depression and PTSD. Um, so good news, we are learning how to treat people in the ICU better. Uh, in Europe, they have roughly 30% hospitalization rate as opposed to US, which was around 20%. It's probably because of an older population. And uh, we have dropped the mortality rate from 60% in March to 42%. So it's a drastic improvement there. Part of that is because it's a younger population that's being infected. Uh, part of that, we've learned that, you know, we, we use ventilator as last resort. If you remember in New York, we're putting people on ventilator very early and we discover we're doing more damage and probably hurting them. And we use oxygen therapy using hoods and, and candela and we put them on the stomach, which is called the prone position there. So you allow the, the lungs to move better. We also have discovered anticoag anticoagulant are amazing. I'll show you some of the data there. And that came out, out of Italy. Uh, they did not know that in China. And then the UK also did an analysis called the recovery study. And they're the one that identified the dexamethasone steroid to be a, this cheap drug that has this huge impact also in the ICU. And, and then in, in, in Europe, in Italy, they're doing study on, uh, on these drugs there to control the cytokine storm. And we know in the US there's a remdesivir, which is in short supply and very expensive, but only for severe case on people really on ventilators. 
As a result of that, you can see that for COVID uh, in the hospitals there, the medium day in the ICU is 12 days. That's stunning. It's double the normal rate for other type of cases. Uh, 72% uh, you know, in, in Europe were on ventilators there. 27% needed some type of kidney dialysis. And at the time they had this huge mortality rate as, as I just mentioned that. So much higher than the US, but they have an older population. So we talked about last week to make sure that, uh, you know, what are the things we know about prevention? You know, please have a pulse oximeter. That's the best indicator uh, if you are doing the day five to 10, uh, if you are at risk of a cytokine storm and having hypoxia and especially happy hypoxia. And uh, vitamins, I'll share a bit more information that just came out, but you know, you want to boost your immune system and that's exercise, good sleep and getting some of the supplements. We have had data in the past on the vitamin C and B, and there's more data just came out on the vitamin D I'm going to share. Uh, be careful with anti-inflammatory steroid because it depresses your immune system during that first seven days where you want the immune system to fight the virus. And the data is getting stronger and stronger that having omega-3 fatty acids um, uh, from Beth Israel could turn off the inflammation there. So it, uh, these are things that's easy to take and they're all good for you. Uh, so you, know, you may want to consider taking a supplement there. And melatonin it seems to be showing some indication of decreasing the cytokine storm. Uh, the data just came out is vitamin D. And this is a very interesting study from Israel on 7,800 7, people there. And uh, they had 7,800 people who tested positive. They were able to show relationship between people who had vitamin D level that were considered to be adequate, which is around 20 nanograms per milliliters, to be inadequate. And there was clearly a relationship that people who had an abnormally a low level of vitamin D had a higher chance of having complication and severe outcome. And so, you know, taking four, four to five hours an IU, which is what I'm taking for the vitamin D, uh, it can really be uh, helping you to go back into the normal zone there. Remember that around 50% of people over the age of 65 have deficiencies in vitamin D. So it's something that uh, is, I would highly recommend you explore. Uh, and, and so, so that could be good, an easy way to fix this. So let's go back and treatment. Remember we have that viral load that goes up here and then we have the T cell numbers that are trying to fight uh, the response. During that period before you can end up in the hospitals there, we're using antivirals to stop the duplication of the virus as it enters the cell duplicate itself. And we're also doing immune booster injections there to help your immune system to fight the system. If you lose that battle there and you end up with a severe disease with a cytokine storm, then we have this cocktail of drugs we're using uh, anti-inflammatory, anticoagulant, vasodilators, and also there's this mucus in, uh, that you know, we're trying to control there. And, and so, so let's talk about some of this. Uh, the treatment that works are kind of in four big categories. Uh, and I spent quite a bit of time on July 17 in this, so I'll just go quickly on some of them. One is to boost the immune system. And that's, these are the blood plasma, the monoclonal antibodies interference. Some that basically suppress that cytokine storm when the body over responds. And that's using a steroid. The dexamethasone is clearly very effective. And then there is a, a technological cytosol, cytosol that can filter the blood. Then we've discovered everybody needs oxygen, but instead of putting on the ventilators, you want to postpone this as much as you can and do different level of oxygen therapy until you know, you minimize the risk of intubation. And then we want to mitigate the damage of the blood clots, which is the anticoagulant and kidney dialysis. These are kind of the four big buckets. And, and hydroxychloroquine is a story that doesn't go away. So a lot of information in the last week. Uh, if you remember, uh, uh, without going into the politics there, there has been multiple studies showing that not only it doesn't work, but in certain cases, it seems to be increasing the mortality if, if given to patient in the ICU in the hospital setting there. Uh, there was a study that came out on July the 2nd from Henry Ford. And initially it seems to say, well, if I give it early, as soon as people get, get admitted there, I have a low mortality rate. It's not a huge one. I mean, you go from 26% to 22%. But everybody now has been kind of criticizing that story, saying it was very biased. It was a lot of errors. It was retrospective. It was not control. But the patient that they had taken in the study had lower risk than others. And they gave them dexamethasone, which we know is effective, while the other people may not have got there. So came to the conclusion that nobody believed this data is reliable. And then on July the 23rd, Brazil uh, released uh, data from 55 hospitals, and it shows that it doesn't work on mild to moderate hospitalized patients. 
And then Dr. Fauci this morning on July the 31st went in front of Congress saying there are no random based clinical trials showing effectiveness for hydroxy uh, chloroquine. So just to give you the latest there, uh, and I know it's politicized, so I don't want to go into that subject. Strong evidence of what works. I'll go quickly there. Redemsevir, this is an IV. It's only for severe hospital case. It only decreased by 30% in hospital stay. It's not a cure. It does not impact fatality. It just gets you discharged earlier. Dexamethasone is this cheap drug that's doing amazingly thing. It's for patient on ventilator. It, it's a stereo that basically slow down that immune response. And it has a huge impact because it decreased by a third uh, the mortality in people on ventilators and by 20% of people on oxygen. Uh, we, there's a concern that if you give it too early for mild to moderate case at home, and we don't have the study there that, you know, when you want the immune response, you don't want to, you don't want to temper it before you get into the cytokine exposure. Prone positioning has been very effective at keeping people away from ventilator as long as possible. Uh, we have learned to have this, this, this several steps in providing oxygen. The last step is the ventilator. Anticoagulant have been a blessing, uh, and that could be heparin or enoxaparin, and there's a long list of those. It break up the clots that does so much damage. It prevents all these long-term damage we talked about earlier, about the strokes, the myocardial injury, the limb loss. People have been amputated because they couldn't get blood circulation in their limbs and their legs. And to give you an idea, uh, this is a study that just came out. It's from the York hospitals on 2,700 COVID patients there, and look at the number. The anticoagulant survival rate went from 29% before to 62%. I mean, that's a doubling the survival rate just by using anticoagulant. So highly effective. Of course, this is something that has to be done under the control of a physician uh, because these are kind of dangerous drugs that they have to be very tightly uh, titrated. But very, very good numbers. We also have learned that heparin can basically be decoy and it can trap the COVID, so it can stop the proliferation or stop the infiltration. So the heparin has two roles: one is to make sure that you know you you, you thin the blood, and number two is kind of a decoy. So heparin could be very, very uh, powerful drug, and we may start trying to use it earlier. And people are coming up with an inhaled form that could be used uh, at the mild to medium stage, as opposed to the hospital stage. Promising treatment there is convalescent plasma. It's very expensive, so it's only being used on IV uh, uh, for severe hospital patients there. The issue there is how long is the antibody working? We, only, we know it works only for a few months for sure. Uh, it has improved the death rate, uh, and we're now starting to use in blood back har harvesting there. We also have this device called the cytostore, which is basically filtering your blood and removing the cytokine uh, from your blood. It's kind of a, a filter that you circulate the blood and you do it 70 times in 24 hours. It's under FDA emergency approval. Of course, it's pretty invasive. Uh, kidney dialysis, you know, people are doing it much earlier to avoid the damage to the kidneys, which could be permanent. And, and then we are uh, experimenting with other type of drugs, which could be cheaper than Redemzivir, which is hard to get right now. And it seems to be as effective. Uh, and so, so, so there's some hope that it will come up with more treatment there. Um, Treatment that under consideration there is some antivirals, uh, which are all drugs, which will make it easier to give to the, to the, to the early case, that first 10 days there, we need more, more therapy for that. And so there's an experiment in India, Turkey, and Russia. The whole world is working on this, it's kind of amazing. And, and some experiment on existing drugs uh, that Merck is working on. There's recombinant ACE2 decoy, so we kind of try to fool uh, the, uh, the virus, so it basically binds to something else than the normal thing. So we're doing this, this, this artificial things there, so it's, that could be quite promising there. And then monoclonal antibody, which again is very expensive, lots of companies working on that, and they're doing several big trials right now. We, we wait for the results. Uh, on the mixed treatment is the interferon, and this is a way to boost and activate your immune system there. Again, these are expensive drugs. Uh, cytokine inhibitor, something that basically has stopped the cytokine. So we're doing a lot of data there. The results so far are mixed. Uh, the stem cell, um, limited success so far. Arvimectin, this is the drug that's a parasitic drug that uh, a lot of people in South America are experimenting as well as uh, in Egypt and India there. And uh, there's a controversy in the US because the FDA is saying that the dose could be too high. But anyway, some good data coming out from South America showing that it could be very promising in stopping the expansion uh, of during the viral infection side where the virus is duplicating. And in Russia, uh, there's a drug called coronavir coronavir, uh, which again goes back after the virus replication. We really need more drugs for that first 10 day period there when uh, before the cytokine storm. So hopefully some of these drugs do work out. 
new treatment, uh, people are looking at steroid nebulizer for children, uh, butanozide, if you know it. And so this is on the market, and uh, some people are claiming, given early to silver bullet, you know, before that that uh, uh, that ten, seven to ten day period, that's so dangerous there. So there's trials at UCSF uh, where we may be able to use this asthma uh, drug there, that's very well known, as a quick intervention there. So, uh, but we did more clinical trials so that people believe it. Do let's do a quick review on vaccine. Lots of new things on vaccine. So many vaccine, I can keep track of it. It's it's uh, it's closer to hundred. At a very high level there, reality check, only 35% of the vaccine works. Good news, it's more effective than some of the other type of drugs we've developed. Bad news, it's only 35%. There's five buckets. Uh, one is to take a live uh, uh, virus like we do for the flu, weaken it or make it uh, um, uh, neutral there and then infect the cells. And so, some people are working on that. And then some people are working at a different type of virus, like an adenovirus that we've developed in the past and reallocated. Uh, some people are doing a new technology called mDNA, uh, which is to fabricate uh, pieces of the virus proteins. Uh, and this is the one you may have heard about, Moderna Inovia. And then, and then we synthesize, uh, we try to produce. Uh, so there's five different approach without going to all the details. Again, I talked about this a few weeks ago. What's important to understand is that none of them by themselves, there's not going to be one silver bullet that wins all. It's going to be a cocktail. And, and it may not prevent, this is the news I heard this week, which was really fascinating, which is you may still be infectious. You may still get the disease. What it will do is to protect you from having that severe reaction that you know, could get you into all the complications we've talked about it. So we still need to learn to see how effective these viruses are gonna be because you may still uh, be infected and, and get the disease and be contagious. So we have to learn that. A lot of those things are, are focusing on the neutralizing antibody I discussed earlier. And, and there's a belief that the way this virus is behaving, that this may only last for six to 12 months. So you may need two injections now, and initially, and then at 28 days. And then another set may be at six to 12 months, which of course could be an issue in cost and availability. People are working on intranasal vaccine to make it easier to deliver. And, and it can be very effective in, in going for the epithelium of the nose. Uh, to secrete the B cells. And then uh, the data so far in conventional plasma is, is great, but not for the long term. So it's like something when somebody's really struggling for survival, but it's not something we can do on a massive scale. A quick reminder, there's all these different technology. Uh, some of them require multiple dose, which is a, a cost and logical issue there. Uh, the mRNA have never been built before on a large scale, so it's like on any scale. So there's a lot of risk on the manufacturing side. Uh, it's easier to get it to clinical trials, uh, but it could be that some of the old traditional virus may be able to get to market faster uh, after they've done the trial. So to be seen. Uh, some update, j, &J vaccine, um, they're using an old vaccine platform, so they know how to build it, how to scale up and how to distribute it, something that was developed for HIV and Ebola. Uh, the data on the monkey showed that it worked. And uh, it, this was done at Best Israel in Boston there. And so... So that looks very promising. They use, an, uh, this is the name of the drug that we're doing seven drugs in parallel. And I think this is the one that seems to be the most effective. They just started a study with 1,000 1, volunteers in the US. And then they're gonna be doing a clinical trials in, in the US and, and in Belgium. They use an inactivated common cold virus. So we know exactly how it works. We know how to make it and we know how to make it in high volume. And they believe that the data is showing so far that it could really prompt the immune system to kick in very fast. Another one that hit the news today was Sanofi and Glaxo uh, Smith Klein, and they just made a two billion dealers with the US government for 100 million doses. Now remember, some of these drugs, you need two doses, some you need one dose. And then they also negotiated an option to buy an additional 600 million doses if it works. The way they work is, is a more traditional way of, of doing the vaccine, and they have an adjuvant from JSK, Glaxo Smith Klein. Uh, which was very well known, so we know how it works. That was used on the H1N1 or the H5N1, the old bird flu, uh, uh, flu. And they use a recombinant DNA technology, again, very well known, we know how to make them, uh, to have a genetic material from the surface uh, protein of the virus that's inserted into an insect, and then we extract, and then we basically purify it and amplify it. So they're starting the phase one and two trials in September. So they got that contract before any phase one and two, so this tells you how crazy the world is and they plan to do the phase three and hope to get approval sometime in 2021. 
Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, they are in the middle of their trial. So we, we'll keep an eye on that. So far, it looks promising. What's very interesting, they have that T cell response, which people think may be longer lasting than just the antibody. So uh, they had a very high response, longer than the survivors. So that looks very good. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. I will keep a try on that. Pfizer and BioNTech, they made another $2 billion deal with the US government for 100 million doses. And uh, they are in the process of doing their testing for the phase two and three. So uh, that's gonna take a few months before we have the results. Uh, CanSino, we talked about this. This is the Chinese virus that the military is deploying. Uh, on their own, so they're testing their own people there. So we'll see how that works. The data from the Lancet that just came out show that there was a very high percent of side effect, 10%, 9% is pretty high to have severe adverse reaction. So, so we'll see if they can penetrate it down and still be effective. Uh, quick update, if you're interested in signing up uh, to be in some of these trials, since they're recruiting you know, 10 to 30,000 people per trial, this is the website coronaviruspreventionnetwork.org and you can sign up. There's over 100,000 people already signed up, but you know, please do that. Not too much uh, update on the other one. You can take a quick look there. So I'll keep you updated when something new comes up. Let's learn from the past. So we had the Spanish flu. So let's go back a little bit what happened there. As far as the World Health Organization, people believe we're still in the first big wave of COVID. The Spanish flu had three separate waves and it killed 30 to 100 million people worldwide, depending on who is reporting it. The first wave happened in the spring of 1918, and uh, it was highly contagious, but the, but the mortality was kind of a flu level of mortality. So not too many people died, they were just sick. And because of the war, the World War I that was going on, nobody really paid too much attention to it. Then the second wave hit in the fall of 2018, and that one, there was a mutation of the virus and it was much more lethal, especially for the healthy young people. Uh, the 20 to 30 years old were really hit really hard. What they discovered is that that, that virus had mutated. There's a belief that COVID is much more stable than the Spanish flu was, but you know, question mark. What they learned after the fact is that there was this super spreading event because of the end of the war, there was this huge parade in Philadelphia with 200,000 attendees in the fall. <laughs> and 10,000 people died within 30 days. Uh, due, due to that big parade. So again, go back to say, we need to avoid this super spreading event until we have the virus under control. St. Louis, on the other hand, canceled the parade and they, only, they had only 700 deaths during that same 30 day period. So they also did an analysis showing that cities that immediately forced face masks, banned large gathering and closed the school over the long term did much better in the economy and in the number of cases than the country, the cities that did not. Let's look at colleges. In the US, there's over 6,000 cases already reported in US college. Uh, and you can see the spread across the country there. So how are we going to keep our schools safe is a big question. And you can see some of the hotspot, not as surprising, it's tied to the, some of the state like Texas and Florida and Georgia, where they have hotspot there. The response to it is all over the places. So in the dark red are the people with more than 50 cases. And a lot of them are basically fully online. And then you have a hybrid of people who are online and in classes. And then you have people who are mostly in classes. And then if people who don't know what they're doing yet. So unfortunately, because there's a total lack of coordination, part of that, we don't fully understand how it works. And part of that, people need that tuition to keep the school open. You're gonna get a very different uh, outcome. And we've seen earlier that these people are contagious. And so we should expect a bit of a spike, hopefully we can, we can control it after we reopen the colleges and the school. And, and you can see already now in some of the, the, the big sports team, you know, there has been some outbreaks uh, in some of those, those uh, type of college teams. So what do we do with school closure? Uh, lessons we learn from March to May is the state that closed the school earlier experienced greater decline in COVID. So they did this whole analysis in the US. There were some states who delayed and some people who basically can see that you had the spike and then you immediately stop it. This is the people who had a delay and then you had a higher case. So, so it's an interesting paper to, to read in JAMA that really show that we need a more coordinated approach as opposed to leave it to every school district mm -hmm. on how to reopen, how do we keep it safe and what do we do when there is another outbreak? Do we shut down the school with one case or do we wait for 10 cases? How do we improve the ventilation? When we decide, you know, when we need to do something different. All those things are unfortunately left at the school level instead of, you know, there's a lack of coordination at the state and of course the federal level. 
this is a fun, this is my last slide. You know, this is a cool video uh, on YouTube. And this is a guy who basically splitting beer at six feet apart on this mannequin there. And then he has a torch. And what he shows is that if you have a mask, it doesn't explode and blow up. But if you don't have a mask, basically this beautiful mannequin, you know, basically uh, gets in, in, into a torch. So even from six inch, the mask was uh, helpful at, at stopping the spread. So uh, kind of a fun thing for the kids so that they can, they can take a look at it. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, and I have the wrong slides here, but this is July the 31st. And, and please go take a look at my other video on the Ant Insights. I hope to see you next week and please post to your friends and, uh, and social networks. Really appreciate spreading the knowledge. Thank you very much.